So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the player type mutation, about methods of dividing up your player base into understandable and relatable chunks. I've done this quite a bit. I've been doing this for about 15 years. I originally started at Microsoft, working on the Halo and Age of Empire franchises. And can I hear about that? I moved on from there to Bungie, where I was the head of research for Destiny 1. Uh, not Destiny 2, just 1. <laughs> And currently I'm at Blizzard as the research manager in charge of gameplay research on all these titles. So I've been doing this for a while, and pretty much all these places I've done some form of player segmentation. And I'm hoping to share with you today my experience and what I've found useful, not useful, mistakes I've made, and some tips. Um, one slightly odd thing, I'm not going to be talking much about the technical details of machine learning or how to do the research technically. I'm going to mostly be talking about everything else. Other people have done plenty of talks about data mining, machine learning, things like that. I'm going to leave that to them. I'm going to be talking about the how and the why. So the main reason I create segmentations is to shrink the player base down to something you can fit in your head. That when you have a million people playing your game, that is suddenly a million motivations, a million ways to play, a million needs, fears, all that sort of thing. And there's no way you can fit all that in down to one design game. And so instead, what we're going to do is create a small number, a small finite set of imaginary people, and make them very happy. With the idea being that if they're spread out across the player base, by making those imaginary people very happy, we make everyone else pretty happy. Now, not everyone's going to be exactly the same. So in this little made-up uh, picture, each blue dot is a player, and each large color dot is one of their segments. Not every player is close to one of the segments, but they're closer to that segment than anything else. And anything that suits that segment's needs will probably make that player fairly happy. The second reason is to create a common language for internal discussions. We've all been in design meetings where designers start arguing with each other from personal experience and anecdotes. They say, oh, well, my brother played last night and his paladin was terrible. Or, oh, I was playing and I had this experience and this is why we need this. And there are lots of players like me. And they start arguing from personal experience, and everyone has a different set of personal experiences, so we keep, there's no sort of common ground for debate. And so, a segmentation gives everybody the same set of things to argue from. So this is a classic example of a segmentation. This is the Magic Gathering personas created by Wizards of the Coast in the early 2000s, uh, Johnny, Timmy, and Spike. And so the idea is Timmy wants to win by playing big creatures and spells, Johnny wants to win by picking a mechanic and using it as style or as a method of personal expression, and Spike just wants to grind your opponents as brutally and efficiently as possible. It's not about style, it's not about good games, it's whatever wins the match is faster. So I love and hate these personas. Uh, I love them because they're incredibly simple, they're incredibly sticky, they're easy to understand, they're very they're all very distinct and you can rem and you will remember them now for the rest of your life. The thing I hate about them is there is is that basically Wizards of the Coast made them up. There is no data behind them. And so for me, and so there may be, this may have nothing to do with why people actually play Magic the Gathering or what kinds of players out there. There may be whole categories of players we're leaving out because these were based on intuition rather than data. So when I make a segmentation, my goal is to create something as good as this, but with actual freaking data behind it. So this is the end goal. This is what we're trying to achieve with all these projects. And finally, I really want to make sure nobody goes unhurt. It's very easy for us to forget that not every kind of player happens to work in our building. Uh, to give you a, a concrete example, so this is real data from Halo Reach. Uh, this was uh, after the game had been out for a little while. I, came, I did a segmentation that chopped up the player base into 10 types. It's not important what they are right now. We'll talk about that more later. And these types were pretty fairly well spread across the population, with the most common being about 20, a quarter of the population, a couple others at 20%, and so on. And then I went back and projected that back and looked at who actually participated in the open public beta for the game a few months earlier. And almost everybody came from one particular segment. Those were the type one players that would be online, engaged, social, competitive players, your classic forum dwellers. And if we had, if that was all we listened to, we would have massively uh, misrep 
misunderstood who we were making the game for. Because if you look at type two and type three players, which are nearly as common out in the real population, they're almost absent from our data. And even and some of the smaller types from five up weren't present at all really in the beta. And so this segmentation can act as almost a checklist that you can sit there and go, okay, we're making a game design change. How are type one players gonna respond? How are type two players, type three? You can go down the list and make sure everybody gets included and make sure you remember to compare every change against uh, every type of player. So there's a bunch of different types of segmentations. Uh, design segmentations based on gameplay, marking segmentations, not on gameplay because they haven't played the game yet. And finally, business segmentations based on sort of things like purchasing and uh, engagement behaviors. I'm mostly going to be talking about design segmentations because that's what I specialize in. But all, every time I'm going to be talking about, they should apply equally well to uh, business seg and marketing segmentations as well. So the first thing I do when I'm doing a segmentation is choose a scale. So you can imagine. Uh, wait, I can't be 20 minutes. It's a 40-minute talk. I'm only seven minutes in. Wait. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're gonna go fast. Okay. So you can imagine fast. You can imagine uh, a broad segmentation like, say, a Myers Briggs for all humans. You could project that back 100 years, forward 100 years. It's still gonna work. But if I do a, se a very narrow segmentation like WoW players, this expansion, our next expansion will have different features, and the segmentation may not apply. So the unfortunate thing is, the narrower segmentation, the faster it goes bad. So if I do a segmentation of wild players this week, if this week happened to be a holiday, the way people are playing may have nothing to do with how they're going to play next week. So the segmentation goes bad very fast. However, it's super actionable. And the narrower the segmentation, the easier it is to make game recommendations and have an impact. However, it also goes bad fast, so you have to redo it. So there ends up being sort of a sweet spot in between having your segmentation be actionable and having it go bad so fast that you didn't get a lot of use out of it. In my experience, that's somewhere around the nine months to a year mark. It's using a segmentation that will go bad eventually, but I don't have to redo it every month. Uh, really quick run through of the parts of segmentation. You kick off, you get everybody on board. You pull a data set of, play, of players that you're going to analyze. You do a machine learning analysis to find groups of similar players. You do a survey to find out all the things you can do that are not in the database. And finally, then you analyze and report. Now, normally this would be the final part of uh, the list, but I believe the sixth step is actually the most important. That you have to follow up and make sure they get used. You have to do a lot of uh, promoting and marketing of your own sake, of your own work. And that, that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to go super fast. OK. Apparently, somebody stole my time. Um, so engaging with stakeholders. This is part of the kickoff process. Number one thing is solving their problem, not yours. Don't do what I did the first time I did a segmentation, is I locked myself in my office for a month, came up with what I thought was the perfect segments, and came out like Moses coming out from the mountain. It's like, here, I have done it. And they just completely fell flat. I blame Randy for not stopping me. Um, so the number one thing to make sure the things have impact is make sure they relate to the problems the design team is having, the decisions they were already planning to make. And you need to uh, build a segmentation that takes into account variables that are relevant to their problems. It's also important to recognize that almost everybody has had bad experiences with personas. Personas are a really common uh, design technique, and people have had horrible ones used on them and forcing them to, do, to make decisions they didn't want to make. So there's a lot of reluctance that you have to overcome to get people to buy into a segmentation project. And one of the tools I use to overcome that reluctance is using fake data. So rather than saying, I'm going to do a segmentation, say, I'm going to make you something that looks like this. Would this be useful to you? And my favorite thing that happens next is they start arguing with you and say, no, no, that's completely wrong. You don't, you don't want to measure this, you want to measure that. I'm like, oh, okay, we can do that. Because you've already won. The minute they start arguing with their fake data, you've already won. They've already won and this is relevant to you, to them, and that is interesting to them. And again, the point of segmentation is to get them used. 
So as you're engaging with your team, your team will argue with you and will push you to make decisions in your sanitation project process that you don't agree with. They say, okay, you have to include uh, PDP behavior. You're like, well, it's not really relevant, but okay. And there's a fine line between letting them shove your project completely off course, but letting them have at least enough input that they believe in the final outcome. So 5% less perfect, but 10% more impactful, sure. And finally, the conversations do more good than the final segmentation. Getting everybody in a room and saying, okay, we're gonna segment our player base, we need to boil down the experience in our game of every player to five numbers to segment to use the machine learning on. Which five numbers should those be? And that's something that's a great conversation. They say, oh, you have to include how long they've been playing the game. Or you shouldn't, you should, you should totally make sure you include what game modes they're playing. I mean, to give WoW, use WoW as an example, is how you played WoW 10 years ago relevant to who you are now? And that's a debate, and that's an argue, interesting argument. And those conversations are really valuable for integrating yourself with the design team and understanding what their needs and concerns are. So I'm gonna keep skipping ahead because somebody's all my time. Um, I'm so bad. So I'm not gonna go into details on machine learning. There's plenty of online courses that'll teach you how to do this. However, I do wanna talk about how to use machine learning. And the wrong way to use it is to treat it like an answer machine. Say you're gonna pull a data set of your players, you're gonna just shove it in the machine running, you're gonna pull an answer off the bottom, and you're done. It's handed you the secret, you are you you have one answer and you're, you're complete. And that this is wrong. What I prefer to use machine learning as is as a probe, as a way to understand what phenomenon is going on in my player base. That when that there's some sort of thing going on in your player. And each way you do your segmentation, each way you run your machine learning gives you a different image of what's going on. All those images are gonna be true, but they're not gonna contain the whole truth of what's going on. And so the way I use machine learning is to run a whole bunch of things and try to build up a picture in my head of what that thing in the middle is. And say, okay, if I run it with total tenure in the game included, how does that change the picture? If I normalize my data versus not normalize it, if I include what class they're playing, does that matter? And when it changes, why does it change? And using it as an exploratory tool, think of it as a microscope. Uh, it's not, the microscope doesn't have a single answer, it depends on what slide you put underneath. Uh, the other important uh, point about how we use machine learning is that I tend to use machine learning as optimized for non-experts. So the picture on the right is what sonar looks like in movies. And the picture on the left is what sonar at least used to look like to an actual sonar technician on a submarine. And the one on the left, of course, is completely unintelligible to anyone who isn't trained. And there's a lot of machine learning models out there that are similarly completely unintelligible to anyone who didn't get a PhD in data science. And so it's very, however, the people who are gonna have to actually act on your segmentation did not get a PhD in data science and don't wanna look at that and don't care. And every sentence you have to spend explaining it cuts down on, uh, I'm being told I have more time, so I'm gonna slow down. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so, so I tend to use segmentation methods that are easy to explain and which people who are not experts can understand because that's what's gonna cause more impact, is, is having something simple. And in a lot of cases, I'll do a more complex model. I'm saying, I'm not saying don't do the more complex model. Do it for yourself. I'll do it to understand that thing in the middle. And then once you've figured out the thing in the middle, choose a model that more or less captures that, but is simple and explainable. Because you want, you're gonna choose something that's basically true, but which reflects, but is easy to explain. Because you, your job is not to understand, your job is to get other people to understand who are not specialists. So a few tips I have of working with machine learning. Uh, number one thing is that machine learning pretty much tells you what you have in your data set. It's trying to find out what phenomenon is actually there. And therefore, what data you feed in the top is probably more important than what the algorithm itself is doing. There's lots of papers out there, and lots of algorithms, and lots of really nerdy details you can get into. 
but what may be in the top is more important almost than the outcome you use. Again, if you're trying to find something that's really there, almost any tool should find it. I strongly recommend creating too many groups. So uh, if you think back to those uh, Magic the Gathering personas, whose names are? Say you still remember them all. Because a small set is easy to remember. And so what, however, a small set is probably not going to capture the full sort of richness of your player base. So what I recommend is creating more than data sets, then you're going you're gonna to want to end up with like four to six. Uh, but what I would strongly recommend is creating more than that. Create 10, create 15, and then group them up into four to six sort of meta types. Put it to, so you do you the machine learning to find out all the little nitty-gritty details, and then group them up to present as a simpler set of things to remember. I also find when I do machine learning that the right answer is robust to change the procedure. It shouldn't matter what algorithm you're using, or if you change your variables slightly, it should probably come up with basically the same answer if the answer is what's really there. It should be intuitively appealing. This, I know, feels sort of like a marketing thing. Again, you want to pick an answer that's true, but you want to pick an answer that's true and easy to explain and which other people can latch onto. It's telling you something completely unintelligible, like the output of a lot of, say, neural network models. It will not be easy to, it will not have much effect. Again, you're trying to explain this to non-experts, so the less time you have to spend explaining, the more impact your model will have. Once you have your machine learning, you've, you've segmented your population up through chunks, you're then going to do, I then recommend doing a survey to find out all the things about your players that aren't in the database. And it should generally focus on everything that's not in the database. So uh, everything that can't be seen from the front, things like attitudes, motivations, demographics, flavor. Flavor is important because, again, you are going to have to market these personas. You're going to have to convince designers to pay attention to them. And so having powerful quotes from your users, having interview video tapes, uh, videos, clips, uh, pictures, being able to bring them examples of each persona into the building and have them talk to your designers is going to help them have more impact. A couple things to watch out for when you're doing a survey. I'm not going to go into super survey data, but you all know how to do these. Uh, watch out for when your demographics don't match your data match your behavioral data. So almost any meaningful behavioral change is matched by a change in demographics in my experience. Like if you look at say the demographics of people who own a Tesla and people who own a Toyota, they're different. Anything that actually matters tends to have at least some difference in demographics. Tend to be a little older, tend to be a little more, more male, more female, than in different regions, things like that. If you have two groups of players who are behaving very differently but are identically identical to Identical demographically, it's probably, you're probably looking at the wrong segmentation. You probably come up with the wrong answer. However, when the attitudes don't match what the behavior, the behaviors the players are doing, that's actually a great thing. That's an opportunity. So if they, players are playing something that they say they don't like, that's an unmet need. That's, that's something, that's an easy place to come up with recommendations to improve the game. If they're, or if they're not playing something they say they like. They say, this is my favorite game mode and I never play it. There's something there that you can make a good recommendation that will have a positive impact on the game. Uh, one co topic that comes up a lot in doing these surveys is low engagement players. In all of our games, we have low engagement players. Players who have churned or are churning players who have just entered the game and really aren't attached yet. And these players are understandably less likely to answer your surveys. And my experience has been that when you send out those surveys, yes, you do have to send out more surveys to people in these low engagement groups. However, the responses you get back, and the responses you get back will be slightly different than the average. So if, say, you have a newbie group and a veteran group, uh, the newbies are, the newbies who respond to the survey are going to be slightly more hardcore than newbies on average. The, the veterans who respond are going to be slightly more hardcore than veterans on average, but they're going to be identifiably within that segment. Maybe. And as long as you take those results with this grain of salt, you will, prop, you will still have a pretty accurate picture of what's going on in each of your player types. 
Next, of course, you're going to merge your call and quant together. I love this picture just because you look at it having so much fun. And, and to create sort of a single profile for each user. Um, a lot of data scientists get sort of itchy at this point because they're, you're contaminating their perfect data mining data with messy uh, subjective survey data, but it's necessary to create a complete picture of the client. And once you've gotten together, you've created, uh, your, you've created your composite segments. You have to draw the rest of the album. That it's very easy to say that, I was sure swearing was loud in my slides. Um, it's very easy to say, okay, I've come with segments here. However, it's very hard to get people to actually use them. And so, once you finish the project, you're going to have to spend almost as much effort uh, doing a roadshow, presenting your segments to everybody on the team, using them in e internal emails, hammering them, putting them up as posters, anything you can do to make them part of the studio's design language and make them part of everyday conversation. Uh, it's an ongoing process and you will keep doing it up until today, hopefully, in a, a year or so, that you start redoing it again. So I want to go through a couple quick case studies of times I've used segmentation in the past and how they've resulted in specific changes in games. So the first one to go into more depth is the Halo Reach. So this is Bungie's last Halo game. It came out uh, September 2010. And after it had been out for a while, I analyzed the player base and found, this is say six months after release, I found that there were five, five basic types of players. The two primary dimensions that we ended up using for segmentation were tenure in the game and what percentage of their time they spent in each game mode. So the first segment that came out were campaigners. And we had a short and long variance of this. The short campaigners were players who played the campaign, then played about, oh, six games of multiplayer and quick. A very common type of player. We had something around a quarter of the total player base. They were also long campaigners. And these were people who engaged in the campaign as their primary mode of play, but engaged in it over a long time in a lot of different ways. So they'd go back and play on higher difficulty. They'd go back looking for achievements and skulls and all sorts of other extended, uh, these are all completions. But also tend to play more multiplayer, but the campaign was their primary method of engaging with the game. Next were omnivores, that there were these were people who engaged in the game in a very broad way, but no single game mode made up more than half their gameplay. And in a lot of ways, these were great players. They play, tended to play longer, they tended to play more intensely, they tended to invite more friends and be more social, uh, and tended to spend more money. There was a short version that tended to play for sort of three months, and a long version that tended to play basically forever. And finally, there were a whole bunch of subtypes of specialists. There's were play players who, for whom hit reach was pretty much a single game mode. They were capture the flag players. They were uh, free for all players. There was one single game mode or one single aspect of the game that was just everything to them, and made up the vast majority of the play time. They all were different. There are a whole bunch of different modes and different specialists for different kinds of modes, but they all were sim had similar tenures and played with similar intensity in one single mode. And what we came out of this was that we really liked omnivores, and we really want omnivores to be, uh, every player to be an omnivore, to be as sticky and as enthusiastic as an omnivore. And this was connected in our heads to the buffet effect. This is a uh, phenomenon in psychology that if I give you one flavor, if I give you like a giant bowl of white rice, you'll feel, you'll, and read that, you'll feel full faster than if you eat a variety of flavors. And that's why every time you go to the buffet, you eat too much. There's just too many different flavors and it takes longer to feel full. And the idea was that if you're engaging with the game in a broad way, it'll take longer to get bored than you would if you're just intentionally, intensely grinding on a single game mode and making yourself sick of it, even if that's a game mode you love. And so Destiny always had a philosophy from the very beginning that there would be an activity for every mood, but this segmentation helped push us toward the idea that we shouldn't just have a a variety of activities, we should actually deliberately promote players engaging in all those activities and spreading out their gameplay and not being uh, monomaniacs. And so an example of this might be the Bounty Tracker, where 
uh, you would go and you log in each day. There was a set of boundaries available to you, and you and those boundaries would push you with random errors of the game. Like there may be a bounty for getting shotgun kills, and you may not be a shotgun player, but eh, there's a bounty for it. I'll give it a sh I'll give it a try. I was gonna say give it a shot. Um, <laughs> And maybe after you finish doing that, after you've been pushed out of your comfort zone, maybe you're like, you know, shotguns aren't so bad. And suddenly you're a broader player. And if you're a broader player, you're probably more likely to stick around. Like, okay, because you're, you're a narrow player. If you say, I only like assault rifles, and we nerf assault rifles, you're more likely to quit. But if you like assault rifles and scout rifles and shotguns, we nerf one, and I'll okay, I'll choose the other. And makes you a more, makes players more robust. And as you can see in this example, there's also uh, a small, a fixed number of PDE, those are the blue bounties, and red PDP bounties. The idea being that you finish up all your PDE bounties, oh, I'm still on play, I guess I'll try some PDP. Even if it's not my favorite thing, that's what I have bounties for, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And again, it broadens the player, and makes them more robust. Uh, we were pretty successful in this, uh, in some cases more than others. One uh, famous example of mixed success is this. This is. Thorn, yes. So this was a really popular and powerful hand cannon that you could only get by doing a quest that required you to do a bunch of very hard PvE activities and a bunch of P very hard PvP activities. And the idea was that by pushing you to do both, we broaden the player. Uh, this kind of worked in that the gun was really popular and therefore a lot of people deliberately made the effort to play in this broader way and try new modes that they wouldn't have tried otherwise. However, uh, the PvP portion was particularly punishing to the point that there was actually end up being a refractory period. That after you did the PvP portion and got your thorn, people were less likely to play PvP for a while than they were before they tried it. <laughs> so, the current player Subrash out is great, but it's important to make sure those uh, new experiences are good experiences. So, after we had decided to encourage these on the boards, uh, in, in Destiny 1, so I want you to think back to the good old days. This is uh, the same occasion I did in, I want to say, let's see, Destiny came out in 2014. This is around, say, November 2014. So, this is back in the, just after the loot cave. <laughs> if you experienced that. And what it turned out is that we had almost been too successful and by pushing players into trying a variety of game modes, they ended up, the game mode actually stopped being a good indicator, the time spent in game mode ended up stopping be, not being a good indicator of what kind of player you were because all kinds of players were playing a variety of modes and then playing a balanced way, of, a, in a balanced way. And so the two uh, dimensions that end up being useful for segmenting destiny players were engagement and progression. Is how intensely you were engaging with the game and how far you've gotten into the game. So starting from level one, leveling up to level 20 by XP, and then from 20 on by a year. And when, we, when we, I did the segmentation, I found that there were about 15 segments of players, uh, with most players following a fairly straight track of high engagement from entering the game, to mid-game, to late-game, to end-game, just happily cruising along, being engaged. However, there were pockets of players who became more, uh, less engaged. So there was a group that became less engaged early on. These were a lot of shooter players. Uh, because Destiny is a shooter plus a lot of um, RPG mechanics and MMO mechanics, there were a lot of hardcore shooter players who had never played those types of games and just found those mechanics baffling. Uh, we had an early usability test in which the player was notified he got his first talent point, he opened the talent screen, said, this is too complicated, and closed it without spending his talent point. And therefore, basically impaired his experience for the rest of the play session because we scared him too much by introducing too much complexity too fast. There was also a pocket of players who tended to get stuck around the transition from XP to gear. So they went through the campaign, they got all the, they leveled themselves up to 20, and they didn't quite get, okay, now I'm supposed to start grinding the same activities over and over to uh, level my gear to get better and better gear. And finally, there was a pocket of players that got stuck at the end of match made content. So at the time in Destiny 1, you could only get to maximum level by doing the raid, and the raid did not have match made. You had to go out and find five other people and actually talk to them and get in a group with them. 
to be able to take on the ring. And so there are a lot of people who just never made it past that social barrier. And so what we ended up doing with this data is to eventually make significant changes to the game design to help each of these situations. But as an immediate band-aid, we did a targeted CRM campaign. So for early players, we reached out to them and sent them emails letting them know what's ahead of them, that yes, your character is weak, but here's some good talents, here's some guns that are waiting for you, here's some abilities that are gonna happen as you, if you keep playing. We give them a little carrot to lead them into deeper into the game. On the transition from experience to gear and get that sort of gear grind and leveling grind, uh, we both sent, we sent them an email that let them know about the activities they could engage in and what kind of awards they could expect. And in some cases, we actually just handed them guns as just an experiment and saying, okay, you're, you're stuck on your gear, there's a little bit of a hump there, what happens if we just give you a piece of gear to make you more powerful? And it's not, it's not perfect gear, it's not gear that's gonna be overwhelming in PvP or get you to the end game, it'll just get you over there your current stuck place. And for the people who are stuck at endgame and not getting into matchmaking, uh, we reached out and told them about, hey, here's some places where you can find people to play with. Here's some sites where you can do matchmaking, do, do offline matchmaking and find partners to play with and people to engage with and get you over that social, encouraging them to get over that social hump and try and get into a non-matchmaking group. So a few final things I wanted to mention uh, in case you have fallen asleep out there in the dark. Uh, number one thing is that machine learning is just a tool you're still the researcher. It's not a magic answer machine that will tell you exactly who's in your player base. It's just a way of looking. It's just a lens. And I strongly recommend using that lens as a way of fueling your own judgment about what kind of players there are and then using your judgment to choose a segmentation that both suits uh, the reality of the player base and the team you're working with. How you manage your stakeholders is the key to the entire process. It's not about, I mean, you, the, best segment, the best technical segmentation you come up with will not have, impa have impact unless you've correctly worked with the team you're working with. You've involved them in the process, you've taken their opinions into account, you come up with answers that are relevant to the decisions they're making, and you've made sure that they are fully bought in on what you're doing. And to go with that, I strongly recommend optimizing for communication. That there are, within the bounds of truth, so I'm not saying lie to your team. I'm not saying pick a, a feel-good set of segmentations that aren't necessarily true. I'm saying among all the possible true segmentations, choose the one that is easy to communicate, that's easy to act on, that is most relevant to the actual, your customers, that is the design team, the engineers, the producers. And finally, the real treasure is the friendships you found along the way. Uh, I'm not kidding actually about this. So, as I said, segmentations go bad. You have to redo them. So, this segmentation is going to go away. This project you're working on is going away. However, that relationship you built with the designer, the producer, the artist, is not going to go away. You're going to have to work with them again for hopefully for years. And therefore, using the segmentations as, and the segmentation process as a way to build those relationships to say, I'm listening to you and I'm building something for you and I'm taking your opinions into account and I'm helping solve your problems is something that can pay dividends for years, long after this particular project is gone. This applies to all research as well. Every play test, every usability test, uh, the relationships are more important that you're building are more important than the data you actually get out of it. This will not be the final test. You run with these people, and therefore, you want to build for the future and build for the long term. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions about uh, the persona. I was wondering, how do you feel about uh, like an anti-persona, right? So knowing exactly who isn't your target audience, right? So if Kim is the person who, I don't know, only ever plays farm bill between 1 and 3 a.m., right? 
And so whatever it is, who she is, is definitely who we don't want to, let's say, design destiny for. And so if you think that that's a valuable piece of information to be able to bring to the table for discussion, yes, it is. I think it's useful to have non-goals and say this is not something we're aiming for. Um, if they're actively playing your game, I don't think there are any non-goals within your active player base. So maybe in marketing personas, you might have a, a, a general set of marketing personas the same way you have, like, you say, OK, game is not built for achievers. It's only built for socializers and killers or whatever. That's perfectly valid. But within your game, everybody should be, every different type of player should be respected and targeted. I guess I was just wondering in terms of, I guess, maybe uh, a feature creep, right? So yes. Helping. Yeah, I mean, not every game is not going to be everything to everyone. Okay. So, uh, in a lot of your examples, you went with behavioral segmentation, where it was very contextual to the game itself. Uh, now that you're working on uh, so many games at once uh, over at Blizzard, how much does that individual game context mean compared to sharing segmentations across all of these different games that, you're, uh, that are under your group now? Well, you can do broader segmentation, but as I mentioned, they're much harder to take action on. Knowing that somebody plays WoW as a heavy raider is much more actionable than knowing that somebody plays 5% of their time on WoW and 10% of their time on Heroes and so on. So it, yes, you can create those broader segmentations and might be useful for longer term product planning, but they're less useful for what should we do next week in our next sprint? Hey, since you dive so deep into these segmentations specifically for certain games, do you think it's even worth like looking at the broader model of the brain X model with the seven types of character personalities and satisfaction? I think they're useful. I don't think they come I think they're useful for as tools for thought. I don't think they're useful for saying what feature should we build next. I think if you have a live service, how people are playing your game in particular is going to have a lot more to say about uh, what your future development roadmap should be. But they are a good uh, starting place if you haven't released the game yet. So it sounds like for a lot of this process, you start with uh, machine learning and then move on to something like a survey, like cluster analysis and things like that. Um, do you see any benefit to doing something like a cluster analysis or a factor analysis or something? first and then going off of that data to determine how to move forward or like how do you do that process again? I may have skipped through that too fast. So what my recommendation was was that you do the clustering off of the you do the machine you pull the data set, you do clustering off of that, and then you do a survey for each of those clusters that you come up with. Okay. And you apply the survey to the survey data to those buckets within the cluster. Okay. Um, the good news is that if you've done a that pretty much you can change your clusters even after you've done the survey. As long as your survey has grabbed a wide enough swath of the population, you can change what the exact cluster boundaries are, and the survey data, you'll probably have enough survey data in each of the new buckets that is still valid. Cool, thank you. Hi, uh, two questions. So one, could you talk more about demographic mix, uh, mismatch, mm -hmm. and how you use that as a signal for badness? So what I'm talking about is when you have people who are either identical demographics but playing very differently, or who are playing very differently and have identical demographics, that at least there should be at least some difference. And it's mostly a sign, and it's very easy for the machine learning to spit out answers that are technically accurate but stupid and unuseful. And I use that demographic mismatch as a as an indicator that that, that, that stumbled into one of those failure states. And are you, like, when you say demographics, are you thinking like age, bucket, um, gender, socioeconomic status? Like, yes. Okay. All the above. So I guess your, your kind of default stance is that those demographic factors, are, they must have material changes on play behavior. Then at least there should be at least some difference between in play behavior between people with different demographics. I mean, older people tend to have less time, tend to be a little less into PvP. There are lots of... I mean, there are stereotypes, and there are individuals in each group that will play, and there will there will be people from every age and every segment, but they will tend to be different. Okay. Tend to be different. And then my second question is, how do you justify to your stakeholders a new segmentation every twelve months? Usually, by that point, the game has changed. Like we've introduced okay. a new game node, we've been, we've had expansion, something has changed that justifies that means the old one no longer applies. 
so the world is so different that your stakeholders come along on that ride with you to say, let's resegment this. Yes. And do you, and do you usually change like your framework, like your you know, load bearing dimensions and other um, data if the aspects game, in the new segmentation? If the game has changed enough. I mean, to give you a specific example, uh, the previous Bob expansion, World of Draenor, had garrisons, and the current expansion doesn't. So how you use your garrison is no longer relevant. Sure, it doesn't. Right. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Hey, so uh, could you talk a little bit about how you generate that sort of those clusters in the first place? Do you use like Hanes, or is it more of like an ocular analysis kind of thing? There are a lot of different algorithms. Um, I tend to use Hanes a lot because it tends to be easy to explain. However, if the data, if the phenomenon you're trying to find in the data really is there, in my experience, almost any algorithm will find something basically like that. And if what you're trying, and what the algorithm is coming up with is such a subtle pattern that it wouldn't come up with in an algorithm that works slightly differently, it probably is too subtle a pattern for your design team to care about. Thank you. Thank you all very much.